Caribou Obama, Kenya welcomes the U.S. president to his ancestral home. He wants to transform Africa into a future hub of global growth. There are issues surrounding security, corruption and human rights. What will this visit mean for Kenya and its neighbours? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. Africa is on the move. That's the message from US President Barack Obama. He's on his first visit to Kenya as president, the birthplace of his father, and Obama has praised Africa's economic and business potential. But with this new frontier of opportunity comes a list of challenges. The fight against the armed group, Al-Shabaab, is one of them. Corruption is also high on that list, an issue President Obama is expected to bring up during his discussions with government officials. Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta was facing charges from the International Criminal Court over alleged involvement in the 2007 post-election violence. But those charges have been dropped. Still, his deputy, William Ruto, still faces trial at the ICC. Well, during his address at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in Nairobi, President Obama reminded Kenya's government that it has a crucial role to play. In order to create successful entrepreneurs, the government also has a role in creating the transparency and the rule of law and the ease of doing business and the anti-corruption agenda that creates a platform for people to succeed. We wanted to come here. I wanted to be here because Africa is on the move. Africa is one of the fastest growing regions of the world. People are being lifted out of poverty. Incomes are up. The middle class is growing. Well, after his visit to Kenya, Obama will travel to the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, where he'll become the first U.S. president to address the African Union. He'll be hoping to improve trade relations with the continent. Since 2009, the U.S. has been trailing behind China as Africa's biggest trading partner. Andrew Simmons reports from the Kenyan port city of Mombasa. Kenya's old decrepit rail line dating back to British colonial rule. Now there's a new track being built that should lead an entire region of Africa into better fortune. It's Kenya's biggest investment in infrastructure since independence from Britain in 1963. And it's being built by the Chinese. Kenya's old railway is so unreliable and slow that 90% of goods go by road. High-speed electric freight trains will use the new line, cutting costs by more than half. And so one way of making sure that as a continent we improve trades within Africa is to remove these barriers. Logistics and transportation corridors is one of the major problems. For it all to work, the main gateway for East African trade, Kenya's Mombasa port, also needs transformation. And that's happening as well. This vast Indian Ocean port has always had big potential, but not the investment. Now that's all changing. It isn't just good news for Kenya but also landlocked economies such as Uganda, Burundi, Eastern Congo, Southern Sudan, they're all set to benefit. Right now, more than a million containers a year pass through this terminal. It was expanded by Chinese contractors two years ago in a deal costing nearly $67 million. But once this swathe of land that's been reclaimed from the ocean is turned into a second terminal by Japanese contractors, another one and a half million containers a year can be handled. That will more than double Mombasa port's capacity. And alongside it, a Chinese company will reclaim more land from the sea to build a rail terminal. It will all help manufacturing industry. This is an American chewing gum company in Nairobi. It's expanding with a $63 million re-equipped new factory. Production is being increased with a focus on exports. I think these investments are going to make a big difference in terms of making Kenya competitive uh, compared to other markets. Why can't I export to uh, uh, Europe? You know, that's, that is something that I look forward to one day. And so long term, there's huge optimism for this region. But like every aspect of life here, economic growth depends on political stability and security. Andrew Simmons, Al Jazeera, Mombasa.
Well, time now to bring in our guests. In Nairobi, we have Mustafa Yusuf Ali, African Conflict and Security Specialist and Director of Arigato International in Johannesburg, Scott Fiersing. Research Fellow in International Relations at Monash University. He's a specialist in American politics, foreign and defense policy, and international relations of Africa. And joining us on Skype from Dar es Salaam, Ahmed Salim, Senior Associate at Teneo Intelligence, based in Dubai, and an East Africa Risk and Security Analyst. Welcome to all of you to the show. We've got plenty to talk about. And before we get into thornier issues that are on the agenda, let's take a moment to reflect on the mood in Kenya. Because Ahmed Salim, people are enormously pleased, aren't they, to see President Obama in his ancestral home. Absolutely. I think this is a historic moment, just not only for Kenya, but for all of Africa. And I think uh, over the past two years, East Africa in particular has gotten quite a boost with President Obama visiting Tanzania, and then now Kenya, and then later Ethiopia. So I think the mood is quite, uh, uh, quite happy. You know, there's a lot of uh, proudness, at least amongst the Kenyans, and a lot of the East African community is quite happy because they see this as an opportunity to re-engage with the continent, to uh, facilitate more discussions that are really, uh, really much needed, and also to, uh, to really reflect on uh, the relationship between Africa as a whole and the United States. Uh, Scott Fersing, Obama was so relaxed at the beginning of his visit at this entrepreneurship summit. He said Africa was on the move. There is a lot of optimism on his part as well surrounding this trip. Oh, yeah, I think um, he's very optimistic about the continent, obviously, with his father being born there. And uh, I mean, even two years ago when he came to visit South Africa in his big Africa tour, um, I think he just loves speaking to the young African entrepreneurs. He even says that's uh, some of his favorite things to do. And you know, he launched the Young African Leaders Initiative and now this Mandela Washington uh, Fellowship. And uh, I think he's got a good understanding that entrepreneurship and the young entrepreneurs are really the, the future of the continent with the demographics. And uh, and they really, they hold the, the future of the continent in, in their hands. And I think he enjoys uh, hearing their stories and uh, seeing the success and uh, you know, seeing all the projects that are taking place with his own two eyes. Uh, Mustafa Yusuf Ali, uh, is that optimism rightly placed? I mean, why has Obama chosen Kenya to visit? Yeah, Kenyans are uh, largely optimistic about Obama's visit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, first of all, he's coming back home to his uh, roots. And uh, 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 many Kenyans across the political divide hope that uh, Obama's visit is going to boost Kenya, is going to boost Kenya's image, the positive image that Kenya wants to project as a powerhouse, economic powerhouse in Africa. And this is going to work out quite well in this visit by the President of the United States of America. Okay, and uh, one of the more positive issues that these two sides will be talking about is trade. And uh, Scott Fersing, if, if we look at this issue first of all, to what extent does the U.S. want to invest in East, East Africa? What extent does it see it as a potential trade partner, a strong partner? Yeah, well, if you really look at the statistics, I, I mean, the trade between U.S. and Kenya and Ethiopia is, is probably, it's very low. It's about uh, 2.2 billion dollars each, which is relatively small. I mean, even U.S. trade with the entire sub-Saharan Africa is the equivalent to uh, U.S. trade with Brazil. So there's a lot of uh, sort of room there to, to grow trade in various sectors, especially uh, in manufacturing and a lot of foreign and direct investment. I think a lot of international investors are looking towards Africa and this African uh, rising image of where they can put their money. And uh, I think a lot of it is uh, you know, wants to look into Kenya. And uh, the Kenyan youth are you know, very innovative, uh, very hardworking, and that's, uh, you know, that's a very positive sign for, for Kenya and, of course, for American business. And uh, Obama's been trying to support American business through uh, various initiatives that uh, he's launched in, in the past couple of years, like Power Africa, Trade Africa, and uh, various others. Uh, but, Mustafa, as we saw there in our correspondent and Andrew Simmons' report, uh, Kenya's major infrastructure project is being built by the Chinese. How difficult is it for America to compete with the Chinese? It's, it's not very difficult for America to compete with the Chinese. Uh, well, we see now there's a general move to... Uh, um, uh, many Chinese contractors building their railway roads and all that. What America needs to do is to focus more of its energies on uh, 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 economy, 
infrastructure and the tangible that which the Kenyans can see. And I think this is what the, 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 the political class here in Kenya and the business leaders want to see the United States of America doing more uh, 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 that the Chinese have actually been doing. Yeah, uh, why is that? Ahmed Salim, why has the Chinese managed to make such great inroads into Kenya, into Africa as a whole, whereas the U.S. has sort of been held back a bit? Well, yeah, I think the narrative has been that the U.S. has been playing catch-up with the Chinese, especially with the narrative. I think the narrative for a long time in the United States has always been based on aid. And uh, I think up until the Obama administration came into uh, to power, they started to really try to shift that narrative from aid to trade. So, you know, bilateral engagements and looking really at the regional economic blocks as a way to enter the sub-Saharan African region. And I mean, I think also politically, the Chi for the Chinese model, it's much easier to uh, make decisions and invest in certain parts of the continent. I think with, um, with the United States, it's a bit more laborious. You need to get passage by Congress. I mean, the AGOA treaty just got passed a few weeks ago, but that was a bit of a battle for the Obama administration. Obviously, the Chinese, uh, to make decisions, is much more quicker. Mm. And they, they were at least earlier in the get-go in deciding that infrastructure was the main uh, way and avenue to engage with African governments. It's less political, at least for the, from the Chinese perspective, and it's easier to get done. You know, if we also keep looking at the narrative, Ahmed, it's, it is said that the Chinese are purely about business, that they're not concerned about corruption and human rights issues. Therefore, it's easier for them to do business. Is that true? Well, yeah, I guess uh, from, from the government's perspective of many African countries, they always say it's easier to deal with the Chinese because a lot of the loans and uh, the funding that is uh, uh, approached by the Chinese doesn't come with any strings attached. It's, it's, it's less of a burden for the government. So obviously, working with the United States, there's a lot of uh, rules and regulations and red tape, uh, if, as it were. But I think that's changing a little bit. I think you know, with the Obama administration, even with its sub-Saharan Africa strategy, they've been really focusing on trade, They've been really uh, focusing on infrastructure and energy, so they're really trying hard to uh, shift that narrative into more, you know, partnerships. So it's not just partnerships in uh, in infrastructure. It's not just partnerships in counterterrorism. It, it's it's beyond that, you know. And I think the U.S. is trying to be less of, a, you know, dictate the terms less more than, than previous terms. OK. Uh, Scott, just moving on a little bit uh, to corruption, because one major obstacle to doing business in Kenya is said to be corruption. I was reading a statistic that the average Kenyan pays 16 bribes a month. So what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, corruption, I mean, it's not just Kenya. I mean, those who live and, and travel and do business on the continent know that, I mean, even here in Johannesburg, it's, uh, corruption is just part of daily life and makes business uh, uh, you know, very difficult to complete. And I think we're judging on the issue of China before. Uh, you know, they did come in and, you know, bribery, and that was uh, you know, a very good way to, to get jobs. And I think a lot of American companies are, uh, you know, we're, we're questioning that it becomes very difficult. It's uh, Africa is still not the easiest place to do business, even though it has this perception of, you know, Africa growing, Africa rising. But there is, there's a lot of simple things that uh, make things very difficult. Corruption is one of them. Um, there's other aspects, like even just on the financial sector, you know, one thing that Kenya and South Africa are known for is it's, it's banking and financial sector. It's easier to, you know, to deal with international currency. And in, in other countries, even in places like Nigeria and, and others, it's not that simple to get a hold and, and to do business. So, uh, yeah, there's a, those challenges I think Obama keeps referring to, that is, uh, that is definitely one of them. Mm. We need to see African, uh, and African institutions definitely grow and mature uh, in terms of uh, interacting more in international uh, banking and economics. Uh, Mustafa, Obama has raised this issue of corruption with President Ken Kenyatta in their bilateral talks, but it is a domestic issue, isn't it? So what really can Obama do about it? Yeah, there's very little Obama can do to address Kenya's corruption. Ultimately, this has to be Kenya's uh, a war against corruption. It's Kenyans that will have to deal with this issue of corruption internally. What, what Americans can do is probably to, to provide international support to, 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 to threaten uh, targeted sanctions against very corrupt individuals in President Uhuru Kenyatta's uh, administration. But, what America is really looking at here, and this is the, the, the age that America is, is, is trying to get uh, um, against countries like China, which can operate even in extremely con uh, a corrupt uh, uh, environment, is systems, institutions, and processes 
that are working so that when you invest in a country like Kenya, it's, you can predict about the course of your business. You can predict the profits that you're going to make. You can predict the environment and how it's going to pan out. In a, in a, in a totally corrupt uh, 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 environment, it's very difficult and business becomes very unpredictable. And I guess the American investors would like to work and invest in a predictable economic environment. And corruption makes it very difficult. Yeah, do those institutions exist, Mustafa? Because we do have Kenya's Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission and they produced a report just in April that laid out allegations against 175 government officials. But are we going to see any prosecutions? Will there be any follow-up from that? There have been a few prosecutions and many analysts have uh, 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 faulted the process uh, with which the... the the, 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 the ESCC actually started off and, and, and uh, investigating these cases. They are very weak cases before the courts of law. And this is part of the problem. But I sympathize with Uhuru's administration because he seems to mean well in the fight against corruption. But he's let down by many other officials and arms within the government. Uh, at the end of it all, there must be political will across the, the political mm. divide. While one side of the Jubilee administration or coalition seems to be having that political will, the other doesn't. And that is teaming the fight against corruption in Kenya and, and complicating Uhuru's uh, track record on the fight against corruption. OK, great. Let's uh, keep moving the discussion forward. We're going to touch on security now because that's also been topping Obama's list of issues to address. Al-Qaeda has plagued East Africa for more than 15 years. Let's take a look at some of its major attacks in Kenya during that time. In 1998, Al-Qaeda bombed the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, killing more than 210 people, including 12 Americans. Less than two years ago, the group's affiliate Al-Shabaab attacked Westgate Mall. 67 people were killed there and the shopping centre only reopened last week. And in April of this year, almost 150 people, most of them students, were killed when Al-Shabaab gunmen opened fire at Garissa University. Ahmed Salim, one only needs to look at the measures taken to cover Obama's visit to see what a big issue security actually is. I mean, we've got a quarter of the national police force deployed to the capital. He's moving around in an armoured vehicle that's been nicknamed the Beast. I mean, I'm sure his security detail weren't too chuffed when he said he wanted to go and visit Kenya. Right, and I think uh, some level of frustration expressed by Kenyans is that they wish the government would take such measures almost daily mm. to protect Kenyans themselves. But uh, I think one thing we need to appreciate here is that both Kenya and Ethiopia are seen as frontline states uh, in, in terms of counterterrorism against militant Islamist groups or any terrorist groups. And this, is, this goes back for over a decade, and I think it's partly due to the United States' apprehension to really put soldiers on the ground in places like Somalia. So really, Ethiopia and Kenya are critical in uh, any aspects of stabilizing the Horn of Africa, in, in particular Somalia. And, and I think w with Kenya, because they're so, uh, in, in many ways, they were almost the last country in the EAC to be involved militarily. So that relationship with Kenya and the United States has to continue, despite all the political aesthetics when uh, President Kenyatta had to deal with the International Criminal Court case, bilateral relations in terms of security cooperation was still continuing. And that, I think, is what, uh, what the bilateral discussions are going to continue even in Addis in, uh, when, when President Obama goes mm. to Ethiopia. Uh, Scott Fiercing, that there, is, there isn't any doubt is there, that the security relationship will continue, but will it increase in size and scope? Yeah, I think um, the security measures have actually increased in the past couple of years. The U.S. African Command has been extremely busy uh, throughout the continent, uh, you know, not just in East Africa with al-Shabaab, but also West Africa. And there's a lot of worry and concern with uh, Islamic State pledging allegiance uh, to several of the terrorist organizations operating. And uh, Kenya and Ethiopia both allow uh, U.S. Uh, drones and aircraft to, to use their airspace because, you know, what they really need and what a lot of African uh, militaries need is, is, is support on intelligence. And, uh, you know, Kenya has been, played a huge role in the AU mission in Somalia, and they're doing very well in terms of the big uh, big attacks, but in terms of the smaller skirmishes we see on the bottle, uh, sorry, on the border, and some that we see uh, from terrorist organizations, those are very difficult uh, to deal with. And I think the Ethiopia and both Kenya will welcome.
welcome uh, you know, more support uh, from the U.S., especially the Special Forces, and uh, any support they can give in terms of satellite communications and uh, general observations of uh, terrorist groups and what they're uh, up to. Uh, Mustafa, do you believe that this counter-terrorism operation is working? I mean, we do still see al-Shabaab attacking, growing stronger as it pledges allegiance to international groups. And that's, that's the challenge. Uh, the current counter-terrorism uh, uh, approaches and strategies working. Uh, uh, partly, yes. Um, uh, um, and it has failed in, 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 in other respects. Uh, we've seen that... Uh, with, with the Kenyan forces, Ethiopian forces, Ugandan forces, Burundian forces, uh, uh, constituting the army swarm in Uganda, uh, um, has uh, uh, denied uh, militant groups, mainly Al-Shabaab, the, the territory from which to plan and, and, and deploy. But what this military uh, um, uh, um, approaches have actually succeeded in doing is not to defeat these groups. It's, it's only dispersed them. So. Al-Shabaab militants have basically melted into the populations in, in Mogadishu, in Kismayu. Uh, they've been dispersed into Kenya, and that's why we've seen an increased uh, number of attacks in Kenya. What then needs to be done is to address violent extremism and terrorism using another approach to complement the military approach that has mm. worked partially but needs to be supported and complemented by other approaches. OK, I'm going to move on to another topic. I do apologise, we're marching through a multiple number of issues here. But gay rights, we know that Obama has brought this up in his uh, press conference with uh, the Kenyan president. It is something that the deputy president, especially William Ruto and Obama, do not see eye to eye on. But is Kenya willing to address this issue? Is it willing to move forward? Ahmed Salim. It's a difficult question, but I think, like many other African countries, uh, the issue becomes even more polarizing when statements are made by the President of the United States or any Western government saying that a government in Africa has to partake or at least embrace gay rights. It's difficult, and I think I'm sure uh, President Kenyatta was a bit uh, nervous when uh, Deputy President William Ruto made those comments. But it's going to be a difficult and long road ahead. I, I don't see uh, legislation really moving any forward, but uh, I think in time, Perhaps there might be a dialogue, but as of now, I think uh, both Kenyan governments and many African governments are going to tread very carefully over this issue. OK, I'm going to have to get some final thoughts from, uh, from you now. Scott Fersing, uh, some do say that this trip is mostly symbolic, that it's not likely to yield many results. What do you think? I think, well, there is some symbolism, but I think it's important symbolism. It's, you know, it's Obama's fourth visit uh, you know, to sub-Saharan Africa. He was in Ghana in 2009 and here in South Africa in 2013, then again went for Mandela's funeral. And it's important. I think him coming here shows a lot, and it shows that uh, the U.S. is committed for the long term. And I think all this is all about long-term investment. I mean, Africa has a lot of challenges. I mean, two-thirds of the, the continent does have access, uh, access to electricity, the peace and stability, and so on. But So it's going to be a long 10, 20, 30-year road uh, but they uh, as people know just by the numbers that Africa is growing uh, you know the large middle class and over a billion people it's it would be foolish not not to be here so by uh, President Obama coming here speaking to the AU shows the importance that the US puts on the continental body but also uh, Ethiopia and Kenya so in, in the end of the day it's uh, I think a trip that was necessary and a very important one for US Africa relations Mustafa, one minute left on the program. Final uh, thought from you. This is likely to be Obama's last Africa tour as president. What's his legacy going to be? Yeah, th thank you. I, I think what the, the United States of America, through its president, needs to understand is that the, the, the fight against terrorism, the fight against radicalization into violent extremism is going to be a long-term fight, and we need to invest in approaches, in strategies that are going to yield fruits, that are efficient, effective, that are going to involve communities. It is the communities that are going to defeat terrorism. It is the communities that are going to end radicalization into violent extremism. And if we invest sufficiently in approaches, in, in, in strategies that are going to involve the communities to address violent extremism and terrorism, in the long term, we are going to succeed in defeating the scourge of terror. There, we're going to leave our discussion for today. Thanks again very much to our guests, Mustafa Yusuf Ali, Scott Fersing and Ahmed Salim.
and thanks very much to you too for watching. We always welcome your thoughts. You can get in touch with us via our programme page at aljazeera.com and post your comments on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or tweet us using at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle and the whole team here, bye for now. <laughs>